You may be seated. The Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados. Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. Professor Vincent Moore, Deputy Principal of the Cafield Campus. Mr. Mark St. Hill, Chief Executive Officer of CIBC First Caribbean International Bank. Dr. and Mrs. Kishore Shallow, who are not here right now, but I'm told they just landed at the airport and they'll be with us shortly. Dr. Ashkai Mansing, Dean of the Faculty of Sport, University of the West Indies. Mr. Raul Dravid, coach of the Indian cricket team and other officials from the Indian cricket team here with us tonight. Mr. Darren Ganga, former West Indies captain and project officer in the Faculty of Sport at the University of the West Indies. Relatives and friends of the world family, present and former members of the cricketing and sporting fraternity, deans and heads of department, other distinguished guests, cricket legends, members of the media, the public viewing online and on UETV, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 22nd Frank World Memorial Lecture. My name is Dr. Rudolph Allen, head of the Academy of Sport at Cafield Campus, and I will be your MC for tonight's proceedings. Born on August 1st, 1924 in Barbados, Frank Whirl is recognized as one of the most prolific batsmen in the history of West Indies cricket. From very early, he was identified as a talented cricketer, becoming a stylish right-hand batter and a useful left-arm seam bowler. Whirl played first-class cricket for Barbados from 1941 to 1947, and for Jamaica from 1947 to 1964. He eventually went on to play for and captain the West Indies cricket team from 1960 to 1963 and remains one of the most successful West Indies captains. World was part of the former double three W's with Clyde Walker and Everton Weeks. With these three batsmen still considered the best middle order trio in West Indies cricket. On retirement, he became the warden of Irvin Hall at the University of the West Indies Mono campus and later was appointed to the Senate in Jamaica by Sir Alexander Bustamante. In 1964, Frank Will was knighted for his significant contribution to West Indies cricket, and in 2009, he was inducted into the ICC Hall of Fame. Tonight, we continue to honor his legacy through this lecture series, which has been supported annually by the sponsorship of CIBC First Caribbean International Bank. You can clap. <laughs> Thank you. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Vice Chancellor and Principal, um, sorry, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal, uh, Professor Clyde Landis, is unable to attend tonight's lecture due to some prior commitments. But bringing remarks on his behalf is Deputy Principal, Professor Vincent Moore. Professor Moore. The Honorable Mia Moore Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados. The Honorable Charles Griffith, Minister of Youth, Sports, and Community and Empowerment. Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, P Vice Chancellor of the University of West Indies. Mr. Mark St. Hill, Chief Executive Officer, CIBC First Caribbean International Bank. Dr. Ak Akshay Mansingh, Dean, Faculty of Sport, University of West Indies. Mr. Raul Dravid coach of the West Indian cricket team. Indian, <laughs> Indian cricket team, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. And this, 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 this evening was speaking about how I used to enjoy watching him when I was a little bit younger. Mr. Darren Ganga, former West Indies captain and project officer in the Faculty of Sport. 
um, relatives and friends of the Warrell family, present and former members of cricketing and sporting fraternities, deans and heads of departments, other distinguished guests, cricket legends, members of the media, those viewing online and via UWI-TV, ladies and gentlemen, good night. Welcome to the University of West Indies Cayfield campus. I bring you greetings on behalf of Principal and Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Clive Landis, as well as the rest of management and staff here at the UWI Cayfield campus. It is with immense pleasure and great pride that we gather each year to celebrate the extraordinary legacy of a man whose contributions to the world of cricket are simply unparalleled. We extend a warm welcome to all our distinguished guests, cricket enthusiasts, and avid learners who have gathered here tonight to be part of this significant occasion. Each year, this lecture not only serves to remind us about the extraordinary achievements of Sir Frank Worrell, but also serves as a reminder of the power of sports to bring people to together, foster camaraderie, and inspire positive change. This is a special year for both Sir Frank Worrell and for the UWI. Sir Frank Worrell was selected to play his very first test match against England on 11 February 1948. And on 3rd October 1948, the new University College of the West Indies held its first classes for 33 medical students from nine West Indian territories. The year 2023 therefore marks the 75th anniversary of the UWI as well as the debut of Sir Frank Worrell for the West Indies. Sir Frank Worrell, often hailed as one of the greatest cricketers of all time, not only demonstrated exceptional skill on the field, but also embodied the true spirit of sportsmanship, leadership, and social change. Throughout his illustrious career, he captained the West Indies cricket team with grace, dignity, and an unwavering commitment to excellence. Beyond the boundaries of cricket, of the cricket pitch, Sir Frank Worrell left an indelible mark on society, championing the principles of equality, fairness, and unity. He shattered racial barriers in cricket, becoming the first black captain of the West Indies team, and his pioneering efforts paved the way for future generations of cricketers to follow. The annual Sir Frank Worrell Lecture therefore provides us with the opportunity to commemorate, to commemorate an icon of cricket, a trailblazer, and a beacon of hope. I therefore want to thank the organizers of tonight's lecture, the Faculty of Sport, as well as the sponsors, CIBC First Caribbean International Bank. By supporting this lecture, we are ensuring that the legacy of Sir Frank Worrell continues to impact on future generations. I can think of no one better than tonight's lecturer to deliver the featured remarks. The Honorable Mia Mormontley is very much a trailblazer in her own field. Similar to, how, similar to how Sir Frank Worrell showed that the West Indies cricket team deserved to be playing on the world stage, our Prime Minister, through her international diplomacy, has been making a very strong case for small island developing states to be heard, particularly in light of the potential for disaster in the face of climate change. I'm therefore very excited about tonight's lecture and extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you. And I hope that this evening will be filled with profound insights, meaningful discussions, and a deep appreciation for the incredible contributions of Sir Frank Worrell. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Moore. Mr. Mark St. Hill is the Chief Executive Officer of CABC First Caribbean International Bank with responsibility for operations across 15 countries in the English and the Dutch speaking Caribbean. He is a fellow of the British Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators and a graduate of the First Caribbean Executive Leadership Program with Wharton Business School. Mr. St. Hill brings us remarks on behalf of the sponsors. Um, 
protocol established. Ladies and gentlemen, good night. I'm really and truly delighted to take part in this evening's proceedings as we remember an outstanding Barbadian and Caribbean icon, the late Sir Frank World. This evening we have an impressive batsman to come, so I will be short, brief, play a few shots and get back to the, my seat. Um, next year, August 1st, to be precise, as you heard, will mark the centenary of Sir Frank's birth. And I'm sure then, like tonight, much will be said about his cricketing exploits and exceptional talents on the field and in life. For sure, Sir Frank was a trailblazer who parked more into all too short 42 years on this earth than most do in a lifetime. We are extremely proud to honor and celebrate his extraordinary life and immense contribution to Caribbean society. This lecture and the annual International Women's Day lecture, which we also sponsor, are among a list of other programs at the University of the West Indies, which are supported by our bank under our MOU. We continue to be involved in both events because we feel that as a responsible corporate citizen in this region where we operate, we feel it important for us to take part in and indeed facilitate part of the public disclosure on issues and matters that are important to the fabric of our society. We're especially proud of our relationship with the University of the West Indies, one of the first institutions we signed a memorandum of, of understanding when our bank was formed in 2002. Through the, U, through the UE, Caribbean people continue to have access to tertiary level education of a quality that rivals and in many cases surpasses that provided by similar institutions anywhere in the world. I am so delighted that this lecture is one of the enjoying fruits of that relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sinhill. The three W's oval is home to the UE Blackbirds and the resting place of the three W's, Sir Clyde Walcott, Sir Frank Worrell, and Sir Everton Weeks. This year, the Bajan Cricket Experience Tour, conceptualized by Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Sport, Ms. Amanda Reefer, where's Ms. Amanda Reefer? Please stand <laughs> so we can see you. <laughs> will become one of our national tours in Barbados. This tour will highlight Barbados' distinguished cricketing history. The tour will visit three of the most famous cricket facilities in Barbados, Kensington Oval, Legends of Barbados Cricket Museum, and the Three W's Oval here at Cape Hill. We will now view a short video which is gonna provide us with some more information on that tour on the screens. Are you a cricket fan? Then you must try the ultimate Bajan Cricket Experience Tour. The tour bowls off at the University of the West Indies, Cave Campus, where the famous Tree W's, Walcott, Whirl, and Weeks were laid to rest. Next up in the batting line is the Cricket Legends of Barbados, Museum and Shop. This beautiful curated museum features tons of fascinating memorabilia of Barbadian cricket stars from the last 100 years. The Bajan Cricket Experience culminates at the Mecca, the world-renowned Kensington Oval. Besides seeing behind the scenes, visitors will also get an opportunity to go on the cricket field, something that few have ever been able to do. And that's not all. A delicious, authentic Bajan Experience lunch will be served at the end of the tour in the President's Suite of Kensington Oval. For more information and to book the Bajan Cricket Experience Tour, visit www.ticketpal.com today. Now, nowhere else in the world can you visit three 
historic cricketing facilities in less than an hour. So I hope all of you go out and start booking your tours. I now invite Dr. Ashkai Mansing, Dean of the Faculty of Sport, to bring us remarks. Prime Minister, please allow me to say all protocols observed because with the list of eminent people here, the five minutes that I've been given will be consumed. Um, <coughs> but um, welcome all. This is the 22nd staging of the Frank World Memorial Lecture, inaugurated by Prime Minister Michael Manley of Jamaica in 1994, initiated by Vice Chancellor Hilary Beckles, who just whispered to me that Michael Manley told him that uh, that was one of the best experiences of his life, delivering that, that lecture. It's our first face-to-face -face lecture since the advent of the Faculty of Sport. The last two were hybrid, uh, were online rather, uh, because as you recognize, BC, we could do it face-to-face, -face, BC meaning before COVID. During COVID, it was online, and now we're adopting the hybrid model. So we welcome everybody on the, in UETV and in the um, global space who are viewing tonight. Prime Minister, you're the sixth Prime Minister to deliver this, this um, lecture. We've had five from the region and one from the UK in the past. Apart from six prime ministers, we've had three presidents of Cricket West Indies, but Alan Ray and Sir Wesley Hall were cricketers in their own right. And we've had three test captains, Richie Benno of Australia, Nari Contractor of India, and Ali Bakker of South Africa. So Craig, you're on notice for the next one. Um, and, and before I go actually any further into, into welcoming you, I just want to tell you how cricket binds, because Nari Contractor, you will recall in 1962 got hit in the head by uh, a bouncer from Charlie Griffiths. And when it was established that he needed surgery, the first person to donate blood for him was Frank Worrell. Well, 40 years later, the Bengal Cricket Association in India held a Frank Worrell Day blood drive where 30,000 people went and donated blood in Eden Gardens in name of <laughs> Frank Worrell. We then invited, we then invited Nara Contract to the Caribbean to inaugurate the Frank World Memorial Blood Drive here itself. And he went through the campuses and initiated that, and that culminated with his speech here. So how cricket binds is beyond just bat and ball. Prime Minister, you'll be happy to know that the last lecture that we had was by Prime Minister Keith Mitchell on climate change and sport. And the action items that he charged us with are being carried out by our projects officer, Mr. Darren Ganga and includes making all of our facilities climate resilient with grey water reharvesting and with solar energy. But just a word to say that Sir Frank was dear to our heart in Jamaica, where I'm from. You heard that he moved to Jamaica at the age of 23. He played his first test thereafter. He became the second captain of color to captain the West Indies, George Hadley being the first, but he was the first to be appointed for an entire series. He served in the Senate, as you heard before, in Jamaica, and he passed away in my own hospital, the University Hospital of the West Indies, at the age of 42. But not only was he dear to Jamaica, he was dear to UWI as well, as he was a warden at Irvin Hall, but also fashioned the Mona Bowl to ensure that it was up to standards for the hosting of the 1966 Commonwealth Games in Jamaica. All grounds at the University of the West Indies are named after him in one fashion or the other. In St. Augustine and in Jamaica, they're called the Sir Frank World Cricket Ground. Here, of course, it's the three W ovals. Oval. Sir Frank believed in the advancement of sport and academics, which is the mandate of the Faculty of Sport. And allow me just to highlight three big initiatives. Last year, we opened a massive open online course, a MOOC, a free course on the history of West Indies cricket, which I encourage everybody to, to have a look at because it gives you the perspective of West Indies cricket and the society and how both grew. We're about to sign, in fact, it's going to happen next week, I think, with a major IPL team with a fan base of 10 million people to deliver short courses related to sports medicine cricket, which obviously will be a, a great partnership carrying us forward. And we've been charged by the Vice Chancellor, Sir Hillary, to restructure the MSc in sport, uh, in cricket science and cricket studies, which will be delivered uh, through the new UWI global campus. And of course, the Bayesian cricket experience that you just got a preview of. So Sir Frank may be considered the first regional giant. And we're grateful to have another regional giant here tonight delivering the future address. The Faculty of Sport welcomes all and recognizes everybody, including, of course, the family of Sir Frank, 
who have graced us with their presence. Our guests from India, Mr. Rahul Dravid and Mr. Ajit Agarkar. Rahul is the, the coach of the Indian team, uh, unless there's something I didn't hear about today. And Ajit Agarkar is the new chairman of selectors since last week. And the first job he did was to take a flight and come over to the Caribbean. So we're well, happy to have both of them here. Our officials of the West Indies cricket team and players, and I'm going to ask them, well, I, don't, I didn't want to embarrass Rahul and Ajit, and everybody knows them, but I'm going to ask the, the West Indians to please stand so I can just recognize your presence as well. Starting with Coach Darren Sammy, Coach Floyd Reefer, <laughs> Coach Andrew Richardson, and Coach Andre Coley. And just to point out that Floyd Reefer is also the coach of the Cavill campus UWI team and the CCC team, and Andrew Richardson is the coach of the UWI Mona team. So there's a UWI connection there as well. Of course, Mr. Brandon King and Captain Craig Brathwaite, please stand up. Welcome to you, and we are very happy that you're here as well. And to our beloved regional giant, welcome to the University of the West Indies. Thank you, Dr. Man Singh. This living genius exploded onto the musical and social landscape of Trinidad and Tobago in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Over the decades, it became evident that his talent had impacted the entire Caribbean. This master of the Calypso art form is a giant of the Caribbean community. In 1977, he joined the pioneering Calypso band, Charlie's Roots, originally as a temporary replacement for, anybody knows? Christopher Tambu Herbert. But then he stayed on as one of the lead singers. In Charlie's Roots, he demonstrated his talent both as, for composing songs and performing on stage. As a soloist in 1986, he gave us the timeless hits the Hammer and Baha'i Girl, which enabled him to be the very first artist to capture three major competition titles in the same year, Young King, Calypso Monarch, and Road March King. He has given us the anthem of West Indies cricket. With his unique and timeless lyrics and melodies, he calls attention to the plight of the common man and conveys the power we wield when we stand up and send a message. Mr. David Michael Rudder is the very definition of a cultural icon. This year, he delivered his final performance announcing his battle with Parkinson's disease. Tonight, we pay tribute to this Caribbean stalwart with Mr. Mylon Clark performing two of his hits, Calypso Music and Rally Round the West Indies. Thank you. 
at the request of the Prime Minister, he's going to hold that second one after she delivers her riveting uh, address. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Clark. I will look forward to hearing the second selection. Tonight's featured speaker is the eighth Prime Minister of Barbados and the leader of the Barbados Liberal Party since 2008. She's the first female to hold each of these positions and the first Prime Minister of Barbados as a republic. Ms. Motley has been the Member of Parliament for the constituency of St. Michael Northeast since 1994, almost 30 years. Between 1994 and 2008, Ms. Motley served in the cabinet of three consecutive administrations, first as a Minister of Education and Culture, then as Attorney General and Minister of Home Affairs, and finally as Minister of Economic Affairs. In 2003, she was appointed Deputy Prime Minister. In 2018, her party won a historic landslide victory, winning all 30 seats in the House of Parliament. You can clap. <laughs> Making them the first party in Barbados' history to accomplish this feat. And in addition, winning 72.8% of the popular vote, which was never achieved by any other political party. You can clap for that too. In 2022, the party won a second term, again, sweeping all 30 seats. You can clap for that again. <laughs> Prime Minister Motley serves as co-chair of the America's Cruise Tourism Task Force for the Caribbean, Mexico, Central, and South American markets. She also served as the co-chair of the Development Committee of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund from November 2020 to October 2021, and is also the co-chair of the World Health Organization's Global Leadership Group on Antimicrobial Resistance. In 2022, she was featured on the cover of Time Magazine, the first Barbadian on the cover of Time Magazine, and was voted, go ahead, clap. Mm -hmm. A lot of firsts, and was voted as one of the most 100 most influential persons in the world for her outspoken advocacy addressing the issues of climate change. If I'm not mistaken, I think this is the second time that she has been listed as one of the 100 most influential people by Times Magazine. She's a recipient of many honors, including the Elder of Order of Golden Heart from Kenya in 2019, Person of the Year by the Caribbean National Weekly in 2020, Lifetime Achievement Award, Chairman of, sorry, Champion of the Earth in 2021, United Nations Foundation Global Leadership Award in 2022, and this honored her as a champion of global change in recognition for her exemplary leadership in fighting for a just, equitable, and sustainable world. In 2022, the BBC listed her as one of the world's inspiring and influential women of the year. And she was listed as one of the Financial Times Top 25 Influential Women of 2022. She continues to open doors and fight the causes of Barbados, the Caribbean community, and small island developing states. She is, of course, considered by many to be one of the world's most influential leaders. Tonight is my distinct pleasure and honor to invite Miss, sorry, I almost said Miss Mia Amo Mortley, the Honorable <laughs> Mia Amo Mortley, Prime Minister of Barbados, to deliver the 22nd Frank World Memorial Lecture titled <laughs> Cricket, Lovely Cricket is More Than Bat and Ball. Thank you very much, Dr. Arlene. Good evening, everyone. You know, when you speak on a Tuesday, it usually means you're in Parliament in Barbados. 
I'm told that uh, their brother of mine, Prime Minister, spoke for two and a half hours. I can assure you that having had to speak in Parliament already today, I have no such intention. Distinguished guests all, let me first of all say that I have been running from this moment for quite a while. And Dr. Allen knows what I mean. And it's largely because I am not a cricket expert. I've never aspired to be one, but I'm a cricket lover. And I am a lover of the Caribbean civilization. The bottom line is that when I was a student in London, the BBC would show these old black and white film footage. And as a Caribbean person longing for home, whenever Lord Kitchener came on, as he was with his various songs, I felt as though I had been transported a la Scotty Star Trek back to the Caribbean. And you have to remember those were the days before these. Those were the days before there was an ease in charge and communication with talking to the people at home. And therefore, anything that resembled the Caribbean, including, ironically, David Rudder, who was exceptionally popular in London at that time, 1983 to 87, when I was in London, warmed the heart. But it was also because we understood that we were still very much fighting battles, as we are today to be able to establish ourselves and to reshape a status quo that very often didn't see us, didn't hear us, and didn't feel us, other than on a few occasions. And one of those glorious occasions was cricket, lovely cricket. Some may argue at Lord's where I saw it. But for me, cricket, lovely cricket, was at Kensington where I saw it. My father joined my brother and I. Not sure why he didn't join my sister. But he joined my brother and I as members of the Barbados Cricket Association from about six or seven years old. And in that, there was a lesson that this was the culture to which you belong. And this was the manner in which you would be raised. And every cricket game, particularly shell shield game, during vacations, and you know I'm dating myself by reference to shell shield. <laughs> and a lot of that time I would be by my grandmother's house in Sergeant's Village, and I would go to the shop and I would buy some exercise books. And she would ask me, what are you buying these exercise books for? And I would say, cricket is coming up. And I would sit next to the radio, and I would score every single ball from the start of cricket to the end of cricket for the four days of Shell Shield cricket. When we played at Miss Carrington School, and for people like me, who were left-hand batsmen, any shot on the leg side would get you out because the wall was 20 feet away, and once the ball, you know, once the ball went over that wall, you were out because you had to drop about 15 feet down to get the ball. So you had to learn to hone your shots on the offside. 
I give these stories because, not because I don't want to talk about cricket tonight, but because I want to talk about us tonight. I want to talk about us as a people. I want to talk about the context of 1948. Cricket, lovely cricket, at Lord's where I saw it. I want to talk about Kensington Oval, cricket, lovely cricket, where I stood up for more than 45 minutes as a young child, waiting for Imran Khan's autograph and Zaria Bass and Majid Khan, only to be outdone by Joel Garner, Malcolm Marshall, Andy Roberts, Michael Holden, Desmond Haynes, Gordon Greenwich, Vivian Richards, Clive Lloyd, Roy Fredericks, Derek Murray. And why? Because I cried like a child when my father refused to carry me to see Lawrence Rowe. And we watched it on television when he went back to Kensington and we were in Tudor Bridge at the house, watching it begging to go. I say all of these things because I have come here tonight to be able to say to us that cricket is more than bat and ball and that we must truly rally around the West Indies. But we have to deal with some hard truths and we have to deal with some harsh realities. And as a prime minister who inherited a debt that was the third largest debt in the entire world, I would like to believe that I've learned the art of not shying away from hard truths. We are playing the fool. And it is not a little bit of foolery. It is a lot. And I'm not casting blame on any single person but I am reaching out to a civilization and to a people. 31 years after the governance report of 1992, then the Patterson report of 2007, and the Wilkin report of 2012, and the previous principles report, Most Honorable Eudine Barato of 2015. And the reviews that were ordered in between there and finally, most exceptionally encapsulated in the Webby report, we continue to believe that we can rewrite the future of cricket in the Caribbean by an approach of fragmentation rather than cohesion, by insularity rather than unity. It is ironic that the person in whose honor this lecture is held tonight was the person who was recognized as being critical to removing insularity from Caribbean cricket. Frank World's leadership was one that was believed to be able to take away, even by his own example of his fluidity of movement between Barbados and Jamaica, that sense of fragmentation that regrettably is harmonious. And there are things that we may not want to say, but I have come to understand with the more gray hair that I have, that we must talk always as family if we are to improve the circumstances which we have. And this is not about recriminations. I keep telling people we don't have eyes in the back of our head. We have eyes to go forward. And when we look at what we have continued to resist, in the name of preserving the participation of territorial cricket boards in the governance of West Indies cricket, and in our failure to be able to have a modern 
framework and platform even for the territorial boards. And I ask myself, it can only lead to one of two statements. One, the definition of madness by Einstein, that to keep doing the same thing over and over and over and expect a different result. Or if I were to translate it into Beijing, how dare you want to hear own way you're going to feel. We did not think that it could continue to slide more and more and more. And at what point do we start to correct the trajectory? This is not something that gives any of us pleasure. And part and parcel of it is because when you really go deep, cricket has been the bastion of the preserver of the status quo. At every step. So Hillary, you would be the one telling me as a historian, that which C.L.R. James wrote when he wrote the article titled, Alexander Must Go, Make World Captain. And may I quote the great C.L.R. James. It is bad captaincy that is causing us to be scrambled. Everybody is whispering and shrugging shoulders. This fooling with the West Indies captaincy has gone on too long, and the time for it to stop is now. The exclusion of black men from the captaincy becomes all the more pointed when the Prime Minister of the West Indies and the Chief Ministers over all the islands are black men. At every stage of the game, we have been battling with the status quo. And later tonight, I will speak briefly as a woman as to why we are still battling with the status quo with respect to West Indies cricket and global cricket to a lesser extent. But the bottom line is that we have reached a point where the absolute imperative must be to change the governance of our game. New Zealand understood it. And it took them a while too, as one may argue, one of those Commonwealth countries that paid obeisance to Her Majesty, as it was at the time. In 1995, they had a report. But it wasn't until many years later that they were able to be able to move from that position. Australia, they took action in the early part of this century, recognizing that the independence of the board managing the game for them was absolutely imperative. And England, where it all started, the notion of the private club, the notion of the defender of the status quo, even they have been able to change. And the same C.L.R. James in his essay on the West Indian middle class wrote that regrettably it would come to pass that the West Indian middle class would seek to mimic the colonizers more than the colonizers themselves. And I ask myself tonight whether the failure of cricket West Indies even in moving from the West Indies Cricket Board of Control, even in the name changes, what is it that will allow us? And unlike Wabi, I'm not suggesting a two-step process to remedy in the situation because we are past that. What is it that is needed for us to stand up and do right by cricket, lovely cricket, and by the Caribbean civilization. Every time we lose now, it is like a cuff in the bottom of your belly. Every time we hear that we can no longer qualify for that which we ought to 
have one I remember as a school child. 1975, the first World Cup. Mrs. Carrington went looking for a group of us all over her school. She could not find us. We were down in the well of the steps to the basement of her house hiding out with a transistor radio. Listening to that wonderful partnership that brought us home. And I ask myself, therefore, what will it take for us to have the honesty and the integrity of decision making to allow us to do right? Some may argue that it is incapable of voluntary decision making. I disagree. Some may argue that we may have to do like India and go to the Supreme Court and have cricket declared as a public good. Problem is, is that there may be no unanimity as to which court to go to since all of us don't belong to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Some of these things bring laughter because we're Caribbean people and we must laugh. As Chalk Dust said, you either write Learn to laugh or you go mad and write your epitaph. The great language of Chalky. But what we have found ourselves in is a predicament that is no longer sustainable. And I pray that there will be the encounter between the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Cricket and the leadership of Cricket West Indies and those others who are of similar love for the game and the civilization. Our people have already voted and they have voted with their feet. I was horrified when I watched the audiences or lack thereof this last week. And I watched it while on the weekend and preparing my mind for this lecture, watched the documentary on Michael Holden and saw that the people who rammed powder a few weeks ago really had nothing on the people who came over the stands and under the stands at Kensington Oval back in the early 1980s to watch the West Indies play. It was an amazing sight to see. And I suspect that none of the people who were born after 19. 80, because you were too young probably to see it then, would have appreciated the extent to which cricket was a mandatory performance for all. Now, it is true that technology has intervened and has given people other options, and we take that for granted. But I can bet anyone money that if we were winning as a team consistently, that we would have the place rammed even if not with people on the roof and under the cellar, as in previous years. So that when our public starts to send the message, as a politician, I would tell you and advise you, it is time to listen. Because what you are losing is not only the financial basis for your continuance, but you're also losing the basis for you to continue to choose from the best that there is because their parents are going to be advising them to move in to different sports. This is a serious matter. And I say so because the Caribbean really punches above its weight in most things. But the one thing that for sure we can speak definitively as being and having goats, they call them. The greatest of all time is in this cricket. When we were preparing for cricket, World Cup in 2007, our countries did so on the basis that we were about to host 
the third largest global sporting event, coming only after the Olympics and football. And we, as a people, agreed to continue to invest because we believe that it validated us, particularly after centuries of exploitation, centuries of humiliation, and it allowed us to show that truly that you could overcome all who wanted to rate you as less than a human being, three-fifths of a man. Cricket, lovely cricket. At Lord's where I saw it. Could you imagine the jubilation of those Caribbean people who were doing menial jobs for the most part? When the team could beat England? And if I felt it in the 1980s, could you imagine what they felt in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s? And I want to contextualize it if you will allow me. Because in the last month, there have been two global conferences for the most part that have taken place in Europe. And at the center of both of them was CARICOM. The Paris Park for People and Planet, looking at a new deal to be able to allow our countries the fairness that we have been denied having not been seen since the establishment of the international financial institutions almost 80 years ago. And the EU CELAC meeting that put behind us for the first time in almost 500 years the possibility of a development model premised on the extractive industries out of South America and Africa, and that the Chancellor of Germany should be the one leading this effort, and that we should, for the first time in any meeting with European leaders, so Hillary is here as the leader of the Prime Ministerial uh, Group on Reparations. And this week we have an AU tour on reparations in Barbados. For the first time, language included, that gives us the hope that not only do we recognize the abomination of five centuries of slavery, but the possibility that the first act of reparations, which was claimed by that West Indies team in London, could now be continued in tangible ways to admit of development in our region for our people in every respect. I contextualize this because we are fighting the battles of our lives and climate and for development of people. And for us, we've always known that our sportsmen and our artists are global citizens with Caribbean roots. Nobody don't ask you for a work permit when you're representing us. Nobody don't ask you for a work permit even. If you're playing the other sports that don't command the same audience that cricket does. And if therefore we are to be serious about maintaining a dominance globally, then we must pick some winners. And while I love football, I opened, helped open women's football in Paris, and they wanted me in Australia this time, and I said, no, I can't come. I love it. I invested money as an opposition member, privately, in the Lime Pelican football tournament, only because I couldn't afford to do cricket. But the bottom line is this, we must pick a few winners. And cricket has proven that it is ours. When we spoke about this at the heads of government, I told the other gentlemen that I could as well be talking because I come from a country 
whose name is spelled C-R-I-C-K-E-T, not what you think B-A-R-B-A-D-O-S. And that I come from a country that has more than a century of legacy in the management of club cricket, community-based cricket, and where every member of the community and the village felt that they had the authority and duty to tell you how you're balling wrong or how you're balling right or how you're batting wrong or how you're batting right. And therefore it is no surprise that you produce the three W's and Sir Garfield Sobers, who is our beloved national hero. It's no surprise. But what we haven't gotten is an appreciation of the link between governance and excellence. Forget about cricket for a minute. Let's go to Jamaica. Let's talk about athletics. Jamaica has a century, equally, of dominance in the governance of athletics. It is part of the culture. People can tell you if you move off wrong, if you come out the box the wrong way, if you're not holding your body firm and straight, if you're bending. No different from what you would have heard here, Mr. Reefer, growing up as a youngster, coming out of a family where everybody in that family wanted what? Cricket, lovely cricket. And not even partisan politics could get between it. <laughs> but it's true. It is true. And, and therefore, you more understand why I start, how I started tonight. We are playing the fool. And you cannot have the benefit of all of these reports from all different types of society, all different parts of the region. And then we say, no, ignore it. So the first issue we need to get right is governance. And the longer we take to do it, the worse the results will be. I want to also make the point that there must be, as the Wabi report also reflects, a relationship between the governance of cricket and the governance of the region. I am one of those who believe that West Indian Caribbean prime ministers cannot run cricket. We cannot. And don't let us fool ourselves. But we are stakeholders in Caribbean civilization. And we have an obligation to help in the development of the game for many, many, many reasons. The first being, of course, that it is part of who we are, the essence of our DNA. But in today's world, more and more, where deviancy and access to weapons of mass destruction are readily available, we have a deeper obligation to be able to ensure that the mentorship that took place in clubs is still there today. How many times, Conde, have you told stories about people who worked in clubs and people who are older men in clubs helping to guide young boys how to get himself in trouble, especially with a girl? Don't got nobody at home to talk to. The persons he feels most comfortable with are the people he's seeing three and four times a week who have become like big brothers or even fathers to him. And they're able to navigate him through a difficult moment, a difficult space. That is what this society is missing. And when we had the titans of business, you might argue that most of them then were of a different hue. They belong to the cricket clubs and they're mixed. We are the titans of business in our cricket clubs and our football clubs today. Where are we getting the intergenerational and the interclass mixing? 
That's necessary to stabilize a society. That's necessary to raise men and women out of boys and girls. And don't let's talk about the girls yet because we're going to come to that because we just dropped that in the mix without having a proper organizational structure for women's cricket. And even in spite of that, they're doing well, better than most. We have, as governments, to get back into the business of serious development at the level, not just of schools. And this is one of the reasons why we had pause between that and COVID, because the government remains committed to putting the first million back in to being able to revitalize community-based cricket in this country. If it is schoolboy or schoolgirl cricket alone, you're not going to get that intergenerational and interclass mixing that is so critical for us to remain a cohesive society. And what we need are the opportunities for people who would not otherwise have that chance to mix and get to know each other to be able to do so. And therefore, the government remains committed to working with the Barbados Cricket Association and others, people like Courtney Brown and others with whom we've been discussing it, to be able to have a serious program that replicates and strengthens club cricket and replicates the majesty of what club cricket did for us as a nation in terms of the fostering of the culture of cricket. In addition, we believe that we have a duty not just to put the million dollars there and to walk away, but as a region, we need to be involved in the serious investment in technology. The ones that we know and the ones that are being developed now in terms of AI. We need to be able to have the psychologists and the kinesiologists. How does the University of the West Indies Cave Hill have a kinesiologist? Dr. Aline, what does the West Indies Cricket Board have? What are the range of skills that we are using and encouraging in our region to be able to get the best out of our players and to be able to sustain them and treat to them in a way that allows them to be the best that they can be, be it cricket or any other sport for that matter? I made the comment earlier about global citizens Caribbean roots, because sports people genuinely and artists genuinely are those persons. And those are the areas in which we have excelled, but they're perhaps the areas in which we have invested the least. And that is why my government is committed to wanting not just to be able to put that money in cricket, but in the budget this year we announced another million dollars to go to clubs, because we understood and it happened in the Parish Speaks when the, 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 the clubs, one or two of the clubs, came up and said, look, we have been suffering. Can you imagine if you are in a restricted movement environment and you can't raise money as you're normally accustomed to raising money? And even the people who would normally give you something smell in hell because their revenue to support their families has contracted. Now, we can't be everything that I would like to be at this point in time, but we can do far more than we are doing, and far more collaboratively. And that is why I've agreed with the President of Ghana that we will ensure that even during this summer, we are going to finance a boys and girls team going down to Ghana to play school boy and school girls cricket, even if we have to do it on our own. Without the opportunity to do it regularly, you can't hone perfection. And that is one of the things that the absence of participation in league cricket, in England and elsewhere, has caused us. In addition to that, we need to be able to make sure that we understand our bodies and understand what diet means to them and how it leads to different performance. Right now I'm going through a detox and I can tell you I'm feeling different already. 
And I have to do it every year. But I can't imagine what it is like for you guys to be out there for six, seven hours in the sun. And if you're not eating properly, you can't have the stamina. And you can't have the clarity of thought. When Asta used to say that cricket is a game, I'm not going to give you the exact phrase that he would use. <laughs> but he would say, among other things, that it was a game that required people who thought. And that was not what he said. <laughs> but that is my summary. I suspect Bishop Adley might be prepared to share it with you. <laughs> but he used to say that all the time. And he said, you know, at some point, if somebody is balling real good, you've got to respect them. But the one thing I know is that they can't ball all day. So you've got to use head. It's more than bat and ball. And I don't get a sense that we are taking our youngsters, not when they reach West Indies, but when they're playing in the clubs and teaching them and mentoring them and showing them the things that may cause them to feel a little embarrassed, a little awkward, a little out of place. Because you're taking people who may know how to do one thing well, and then you throw them in another environment, and you ask them to adjust and hope that they can manage, they can manage that disruption in what they're accustomed to just overnight. I believe that as governments, we therefore have a responsibility in the development of the game to work hand in hand with respect to the people. The third area that I want to speak to is the area of breaking the status quo and dealing with discrimination. And I look at my Minister of Labor deliberately because since coming to office, we have passed legislation for the non-discrimination of all workers, to protect all workers from discrimination on any ground whatsoever. But yet, we haven't seemed to quite work out how we can fit these girls and these women into this game. And we treat them as an apostrophe to all that we are doing. We don't have proper levels. We don't have proper opportunities. I'm sorry that the president isn't here and hasn't joined us yet because when he first met with me, in fact, I would say he's the only person I've ever met with from Cricket West Indies in five years as Prime Minister of Barbados, which tells the story in and of itself. When he met with me, just before he was elected, as he was doing his tour around the region, it happened to be International Women's Day. And it is ironic that First Caribbean sponsors two lectures, cricket and women, and I'm coming to you to sponsor a game then. <laughs> and you'll hear it before the end. And I mentioned to him that the women have to travel last class, even if they're going far, where the men get to travel business and better. And he, like, he looked and he doubted me. But to his credit, within a month of being elected, Cricket West Indies made the change and have ensured that the women are not discriminated against in the travel <laughs> to long matches. But it isn't only that. I sh should have expected that the most honorable Yudin Barato would have contextualized the circumstances of women in cricket better than anybody else, as she did in her 2015 report. The problem is, is that in 18 months' time, it will be a decade since that report came. And the problem is, that we still have almost a disdain for them. The government of Barbados, when it came to my attention, removed the awful discriminatory act where only the men 
who play for West Indies benefit from duty-free cars. The women who play for West Indies now benefit from duty-free cars in this country as well. But equal pay for equal work. And even if you say, as some are wont to tell me, well, you know, there's a lot more money in the men's game. The truth is that the West Indies has already been relegated to two tests and two or three one days. So that the money has already started to diminish. But the men are still paid here, and the women are paid three to five times less. Indeed, the women are paid less. Or let me put it another way. The men pay, are paid more for a regional game than the women get for a non-regional game. Now, something has to be fundamentally wrong when a woman can get, and I don't know if it's changed in the last few months, so I stand corrected, but women can get $200 for a regional game and the men $900. Or women get $750 for a non-regional game, ODI or T20, and the men get, what, $2,500 and $4,000 for those games, respectively. And even if you feel you can't get there in one fell swoop, you certainly can't be paying a quarter and a fifth and a third of what is being paid to the men. The reality is that every morning you are watching now women play football in World Cup football, and they have managed the game such that the attendance is as much as it is for the men's. And I'm not asking you what I suspect, because I had the honor, as I said, of helping to open the Women's World Cup four years ago in Paris. And the stadium was ram, ram, ram. The truth is that a creative mind will allow for the kind of marketing the kind of sponsorship, and the kind of opportunities. But what bothers me is that because there has not been a similar club structure and a similar domestic structure to be able to get the best out of our girls, we are still not, therefore, dominating the game in a way that we could if we had a different approach to the development of girls' cricket and women's cricket at our national territory levels and not just as a team for Cricket West Indies. This region can do better and must do better. And in the name of the man who, though not the very first, but the first, as we heard, to sustain captaincy through a season, I make bold tonight to say that we will not do well until we remove all vestiges of discrimination from this game in the same way that we must remove all vestiges of discrimination from our societies. Because that is who we are. And if others globally don't want to do it, then we must lead the way in doing it. The beautiful thing about Caribbean civilization is that whatever little we had, what we do? Share. Share. And when we talk about global moral strategic leadership, and we talk about Sir Frank and his act with Neri Contractor, or we talk about, and we hear from Suez about how Sir Frank, even before he assumed captaincy, led as a captain without having the name captain. It is because he understood what leadership is about and that it first and foremost must be rooted in morality. And I therefore hope that we can see our way to doing right by those who are our mothers, our sisters, our partners, our citizens, our builders of this Caribbean civilization. The last area that I want to speak about 
is the business of cricket. Because even though it is clear that we cannot and have not been able to benefit from the globalization of cricket as we should have, there's a good old Bajan saying, what in catch you, in pass you. And I regret that we did not seek to establish our dominance in the Americas when we were truly dominant in the Americas. But it is not too late. And more and more, whether it is in food security, energy security, or cricket, we need to understand that ownership matters. Ownership matters. There are too many Caribbean citizens in the diaspora and too many opportunities in Latin America for us not to be strategic in the development of them in order to be able to create a platform first and foremost from coaching, from other allied aspects of the game, from the ownership of franchises, the ownership of stadia, the ownership of software, the utilization of artificial intelligence with others who are in the area of IT and AI, to leverage not only those current players who may rise to the occasion, but the ones who are still available to us through either video or live person. I had hoped many years ago that we would have been far more aggressive in the utilization of the opportunities available to our legends, especially given their absence of appropriate compensation in the many decades that they performed and played. The truth is that the technology has moved so quickly that we have to be smart about how we leverage their images and their lessons. We can still boast as the smallest rock in the world to have produced the greatest opening batsman pair who are both still alive. As Matt would say, yes, you can clap for that. But how have we leveraged it? And at one point in the past, we've said to them, let us come together, let us do it. But Cricket West Indies has an obligation once again to change its governance model. And this is where I differ from the Wabi report again. I believe strongly that we have a duty to establish a public company. That is, yes, capitalized by shareholding from the Cricket West Indies, but also that will be open to equity participation by every Caribbean person, even the ones who are holding their hearts in this May. Because deep down, even when we get upset, we love bad and we love hard, and we still love you all. But you have to start to put our money where our mouth is. And we need money in the game to finance the technology. We need money in the game to be able to carry our players and put them on a level playing field with those other teams who have access to the best that the world has to offer. And we understand that it will be difficult for governments who may be fiscally strapped at a time when the world is reeling from pandemic to climate, to inflation, to global supply disruption, to crime, to all of those things. But I also understand that every time we have been successful as a nation, it is not when governments act alone or entities act alone. It is when we come together as a people. In 2018, when we had our dollar at risk, we came together as a people. And above all else, we put everything into wanting to save the value of our dollar because we understood what devaluation would mean to ordinary people. 
and the inflationary impact that it would have. When COVID came, we knew we could not fight it from the public sector alone. And we worked, therefore, as one. From the soldiers in the Barbados Defense Force, right back to the private medical fraternity, the public medical fraternity, the private sector, the labor movement, everybody. And this has to be a clarion call for us. Not qualifying again. This morning when my Minister of Sport told me that we had only sold, Cricket West Indies had only sold 600 tickets for the game. I felt like crying. And I said then, even as bad as it may seem, go and buy tickets for the school children of this country and let them go in and they're going to see good cricket or bad cricket, but they're going to see cricket. <laughs> Two days. Can't break us. Get the coaches to carry the ones under 11 and 12 and let the other teams who want to go come and register. Minister of Sports is here. And the people who want tickets for Thursday can register at Sports Council tomorrow. And the people who want tickets for Saturday can register tomorrow or Thursday for Saturday. Because where's my saxophonist? <laughs> we are going to rally round the West Indies. <laughs> Barbadians are not known to be fair weather friends. Barbadians may take a little longer to warm to people when they first meet them. But when a Bajan tell you we is we, there is no stronger commitment to solidarity than we as we. And we will carry the burden and the scars if we believe that what we are doing is the right thing. And I know that life is full of valleys and peaks. And it is not always ours, as I said in Parliament in a tribute to Sir Lloyd when I reflected on the comments given to me by the then person who believed that he could beat Sir Lloyd in 1986 and lost him. He said to me that the hands that cheer you are the hands that jeer you. And the problem with us is that when we win, we need no friends, and when we lose, we have no friends. But I'm here tonight to tell you that rain or sun, our country's name could as well be spelled C-R-I-C-K-E-T. And we are going to defend that and we are going to instill it in our people because that is who we are. Next year, will represent a century. That's how Frank was born. We have known what it is to give this region leaders of excellence. And so Frank was a global leader. I'm told that he was the first sportsman ever to have a memorial service in Westminster Abbey. I wasn't around. I didn't know Sir Frank. But I knew Sir Frank's widow, Lady World, Velda World, your aunt, Steve. She took me to London with my mother when I went to London for the first time as a student. And therefore, part and parcel of my maturing process was honed by her. I knew his children and his stepchildren. And I always counted it as a great loss not to have been born early enough to have known the man. There are generations of Barbadians who regrettably 
do not know who Frank Worrell is. And just as we will celebrate next year the centenary of Shirley Chisholm's birth, another great Barbadian woman daring to take on issues that are as relevant today as they were 50 years ago when she presented herself as a credible candidate for the presidency of the United States of America and a main political party. That we, just as a documentary is being made on her life, the government of Barbados will work with others to have a documentary made on the life of Sir Frank World before the centenary <laughs> next year. In addition, we, through the Ministry of Housing, will do that which has to be done to make sure that the glory of Bank Hall is captured and remain in Bank Hall. I say all of these things conscious that if we don't intervene and to help to carry on the story, the legacy, we will have only ourselves to blame. And it is easy to wallow in despair rather than to pick yourself up and ready to fight again. And this world and everything that we are facing requires what? Resilience. And we come from a resilient people. What our forebears went through, we will never, ever, ever come close to experiencing. So if it hurts, suck it in. And let's move again. And I want to speak to the West Indies cricketers, boys and girls. Understand that this is not bat and ball. Understand that this is, this is a civilization that is powered by you. Our currency in the Caribbean is cricket and education. It is fortuitous that Frank Worrell embodied both. And it is fortuitous that I speak to you in a location that embodies both. And if we haven't gotten it through to our youngsters coming up, I once went and told a young cricketer that Sagari was willing to work with him. And the man looked at me as if I was talking gibberish. <laughs> and you all know that I have a few choice words that I gave him. Because there is no civilization that can reproduce and sustain itself if it does not respect its elders and excellence. I did not come to offend anybody, and I hope I haven't. But I've also come to say that it is more than bat and ball. And it is cricket, lovely cricket. And just as I took pride in being able to score and to learn everything, welcome the president. President, you come in at the right time. <laughs> just as I took pride in being able to say that, it is critical that we can speak to each other with the frankness but with the emotion that we are one family. And part and parcel of that, yes, is to remove the bastions of the status quo. And part and parcel of it, we know we like to tell politicians don't only walk the walk, don't only talk the talk, but walk the walk. But I need to tell cricket that too, because we can't have one set of rules applied one day and another set of rules applied another day. And if we are to be true to being able to get Caribbean people to rally around the West Indies, then the building of the trust, the changing of the governance model, the recognition 
that we must put new structures in place to be able to fuel the business of cricket even beyond the dominion of the West Indies team. And the ability to break new ground. It is fortuitous again that you walked in because one of the things that I asked of you and offered you is that I would like Kensington Oval to be the location for a mixed gender game of international repute. The best women and the best men in cricket must come together in the 21st century and play in the same game, on the same team, next to each other, to be able to remove from our minds the notion that there should be separatism and elitism. I hope that you will find favor with this recommendation, among the many, many, many other things that you have to do, <laughs> but that you will find favor, because if nothing else, we must show the world that the Caribbean is capable always of global, moral, strategic leadership. My friends, I wish that I could snap my finger and do like Bob Marley and say, everything is going to be all right. But I'm old enough to know that simply wishing it and simply wanting it will not make it happen. And I hope that those of us who are responsible in our various positions, and that is why the concept of the Cricket Advisory Council for Stakeholders still matters, separate from the board. I hope that those of us who understand what cricket means as the currency of development, as the currency of our civilization, that we will band together not to band our bellies in crying and shame, as mothers do, but band together in solidarity. Because in rallying around the West Indies, we have a way of reaching far, far, far more people than even I can reach as a politician or as a leader. Because we have the ability to get into the hearts and minds of people across the globe. When I spoke of those two conferences held in Europe, what I didn't say is that we managed to have involved in both of them half the population of the world. With Africa's 1.4 billion and the members of the G20 countries and then the 60 countries of Latin America and Europe, we, the Caribbean, were able to help secure and build ground where two, three years ago, we could not build it on reparations or extractive industries or reform of international financial institutions. And I give you that example to simply say that even when it seems as though all is lost, dig deep, because in the bottom of our bellies, we have the seed of greatness and the seed of resilience. Barbados will be here always for cricket in the West Indies. And I hope and pray that working together with all of the rest in the region, that we can put together the unity that is necessary and shun the insularity that regrettably seems too much to be dominating our discussions. This region, when we come together, just as our people, when we come together, succeed, when we play together, commit together, and do together. I want, as I close, to thank First Caribbean and the University of the West Indies for carrying on the legacy of a great Barbadian man. And a time may come when we have to review how we continue to honor 
those that should be in the pantheon that we have so that our children will not ask who is Frank Worrell and that they too will understand that in a land far, far, far away and many, 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 many times larger than us that almost a half a million people hit the road to give him a Barbadian born in Bank Hall a guard of honor more than 50 years ago. I ask us tonight, will we play for the next guard of honor and who will receive it? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you can do better than that. I know. All right, uh, Mr. Clark, are you ready? <laughs> I think it's quite fitting right now.
Thank you again, Mr. Mylon Clark. Let's give him another round of applause. And PM, thank you for leading us. At this time, we want to present our guest speaker with, I guess, a token of appreciation um, on behalf of the sponsors. I'm going to ask Mr. Mark St. Hill to come on stage along with Prime Minister Motley. Well, on behalf of First Caribbean, I thank you for an enlightening lecture. But I hope it has resonated with all of us that we have to own this, every one of us, that cricket is so important for the rest, not only for, for our future, but it's all part of us. I really love the statement. It's in our DNA, and we must not let it fail. And I believe when we all leave here, it will not fail. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I just want to share one more thing. Earlier this year when the new, the nominee as he was then, was announced to the president of the World Bank, on my way back coming through London, I got a call saying that he wanted to meet me and he would come to the airport at Heathrow even though I was only there for 90, 100 minutes. And I need not tell you what immediately broke the ice in the first five to 10 minutes. He asked me, is it true that there's a statue of Sagari on the road on which he lives? <laughs> and then he started to talk about Gavaskar, the real master. But when he started to talk about Bishan Bedi, I knew that he was a real cricket fan. <laughs> because in my young days in scoring, I would have also been scoring in that same series when Gavaskar and Bishan Bedi performed in the Caribbean. And I have promised him one thing and one thing, that opportunity to be with Cigarfield Sobos. When President Kigame came here last year, the one person that he wanted to meet was Cigarfield Sobos. Gentlemen, understand where you're carrying. I call on Mr. Darren Ganga, former West Indies captain and a project manager in the Faculty of Sport to give us a vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. What a way to rally. Whew. Protocols established, good night, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. CIBC First Caribbean International Bank in association with the University of the West Indies, the Principal's Office, and the Academy of Sport would like to express appreciation to firstly, Honorable Prime Minister, I feel you. I must say that. As a West Indian, we love you, and it is an occasion that has made me personally a wealthier man, and I'm sure the same for everyone present in this room and listening. Your speech was captivating. As a young professional in the Caribbean, I just don't see you as the Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados. I see you as a Caribbean leader, a global leader, and I think the same applies for a lot of people. What I was surprised about is uh, 
your deep, passionate stories around the game of cricket and even around the man himself who we are celebrating here tonight, Sir Frank Worrell. There's so many things in that presentation that I hope and pray that all of us as a West Indian people will take on board. Your thought on unity and collaboration and just reinforcing the fact that West Indies cricket is one of the few things that does that is really a statement. The framework that you spoke about that needs to be bolstered at regional cricket is something that many across the Caribbean have spoken about, and I do hope that those words don't fall on deaf air. Governance, your focus on women's cricket, and the multiplicity of things that you have shared tonight, I do hope that action is taken in that regard. So thank you very much for your brilliant presentation tonight. <laughs> Professor Winston Moore, uh, sir, thanks very much for welcoming us to your campus, reinforcing the fact that uh, Sir Frank was a person of great skill as a cricketer, also a person who had great leadership and was an agent for social change. So thank you very much for enlightening us and hosting us tonight. Mr. Mark St. Hill, CEO of uh, CIBC First Caribbean Bank, without you, this would not be possible. Just reinforcing the great role that you play in the development of not only sport, but in Caribbean society, we thank you for your continued support. <laughs> Mr. Mylon Clark, you added so much flavor to the night, you made it very much a West Indian affair with your two hits, and I think the timing of the second one was most appropriate. So thanks, Honorable Prime Minister, for putting the icing on the cake for that, um, that directive. Uh, Dr. Rudolph Allen, your role as Master of Ceremonies was done with such ease. You invited us, you showed us warmth, and you led proceedings brilliantly. Last but not least, Dr. Akshay Man Singh, Dean of the Faculty, thank you very much for your greetings and for welcoming us and your continued leadership in the faculty. I'd also like to thank Caribbean Cuisine, Gardenia Floral, Field Tech Staging Solutions, and the following offices of the University of the West Indies. Principal's Office, Office of the Prime Minister, the Office of Marketing and Communications, the Maintenance Department, the Business Development Office, Faculty of Sport, the staff at the Academy of Sport, the Campus Registers Office, Campus Security, the UE Ushers who took great care of us, UE TV as well for allowing us the conduit to broadcast this to the wider Caribbean and into a bigger space. Again, last but not least, the audience, you've been so engaging so attentive, and I hope that you've enjoyed this afternoon. We thank you very much for making this evening special. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Daringanga. Just one announcement I want to make before we finish off proceedings tonight. Uh, the University of the West Indies is celebrating 75 years 75 years, think about it. And Cafil Campus is celebrating 60 years. So on August 24th, there will be a UE Cafil Select 11 playing the Nation News Publishing House Select 11 here at Cafil Campus at the 3Ws Oval. So we're inviting all of you to come back and join us in that game celebrating the Cafil Campus. In September, we're going to have a game celebrating 75 years of the University of the West Indies at Cable Campus. So stay tuned for more information on that game, and we look forward to inviting you back and seeing you here to celebrate both Cable Campus and the University of the West Indies. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of tonight's proceedings. I want to thank you again. Uh, and the Prime Minister said something. I know you guys missed it, but she said she was running from this for about a year. Anyone who knows me well, I'm extremely persistent. <laughs> you can't get away. <laughs> Prime Minister, thank you again 
for coming tonight and delivering a fantastic message to West Indies cricket and to the people of the region. Thank you very much. <laughs> to our viewing public and you who are here tonight, thanks for attending the 22nd Frank World Memorial Lecture. We invite you to have some light refreshment in the courtyard with us and mingle and chat. Um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a wonderful night. Please allow the especially invited guests to leave first, and then you can join us.